Good afternoon. I could do a little better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, delighted you're here for our fifth annual Investor Day. We're very excited about how GSV Capital is positioned for the future, and we're also excited about the program that we have for you this afternoon. Um, by the way, for, the, for those that haven't had the pleasure to meet, my name is Mike Moe. I'm founder of GSV. I'm chairman of GSV Capital. On behalf of my colleagues at GSV, I want to welcome you here. I also want to acknowledge a few people in the room, a part of the GSV family. Uh, one, Mark Klein, uh, our uh, CEO of GSV Capital. You can give him a hand. I mean, he's done a good job. <laughs> We've got board member Dave Patrick. In fact, anybody with GSV, please stand up just real quick so everybody can see you. And also, I want to, before I get going with my remarks, I also uh, want to make a special mention um, and thank you. I, I don't, for those of you who saw our 8K that we filed last night, um, we announced that Bill Tanona, our CFO of the past four years, um, is, t is, is leaving to join uh, a hot technology company in the city. Um, and so while we're very disappointed that Bill is leaving, um, he's always been part of the GSC family, and, and we're very appreciative of the job that he's done. So Bill, stand up and please give him a hand. So it has been a primary focus of ours from the beginning, but I think we put this in overdrive in the past 12 months, is really in fo focusing on how we enhance shareholder value. And so we've taken a number of steps over the past 18 months um, to really um, drive home the point that we are doing everything we can to um, enhance shareholder value. So some of those things, uh, we, we announced initially a $10 million share repurchase program. We expanded that to $15 million. Uh, we've used approximately half of that um, to support our stock that we think is uh, attractive and therefore we should be buying it ourselves. Also, we did a convertible debt tender earlier this year. We bought back about $5 million of a $69 million convertible debt that matures this fall. Uh, we voluntarily did a fee reduction from 2% management fee to 1.75% management fee. We um, did an uh, adjustment to our incentive um, fee, performance fee, again, voluntarily, because what we realized is that we had uh, not the exact same incentives or alignment that our, sh that our shareholders did. We wanted to make sure that we were exactly on the same page. We've, we voluntarily gave up a ha uh, $5 million of performance fee in that process and set uh, effectively a high uh, watermark above $12, I think it's $12.25 um, for before we start to kick in in terms of our, our, our performance fee. Uh, we've also focused on the things that we can control like reducing expenses, for, you know, for running the, the public company, a 20% reduction year over year in expenses and bills done a fantastic job with that for us and we're very appreciative. Also, we did a $40 million convertible debt uh, offering this spring at more favorable terms than the previous one, so that gives us um, plenty of capital to retire or convert um, this fall and also a lot of dry powder to invest in the most dynamic emerging growth companies in the world. Over the last 12 months, we've had our NAV, our book value, uh, steadily climb up to 999. We've also had a stock that uh, investors have given some recognition to a number of the things I just mentioned. So our stock up over 50% since our investor day last year. That's more than double the performance of the NASDAQ. So we think you know, we're, we're, we're a long way from where we want to be, but we can see the progress that, that we're making. Also, um, even with the 50% increase in stock price, we still are selling a, today a 32% discount to our NAV. Um, we think that does provide a compelling situation where we have strong fundamentals of the portfolio and sell a significant discount. So you get the double play. And if you pay attention to what the public filings are, you can see not only is GSV Capital buying back stock, but so are the directors as, as well as, as, as the officers. In terms of some things that went on in the portfolio last year, 2017, net realized gains versus losses. Uh, on good news, $42.3 million of gains. We had losses of $41.4 million with a net of $880,000. What we've been doing, and this is more than just last year, it's been over the last several years as we've been aggressively 
going to take out positions that are not going to be um, what we had hoped, and we're looking to put capital to work in the companies that we think have the greatest potential. And we, so we've cleaned out a lot of that portfolio over the last couple of years, and we think we're in position very well looking ahead. In terms of some of the gains that we had, Jam Software, we realized a $25.5 million gain with its sell to Vista. That's a 38.7% IRR. Spotify, we monetized part of our position in Spotify, taking advantage of a rapidly rising uh, stock price in the private markets where we realized a $10.3 million gain on the small portion that we sold, which is a 29.7% IRR. Chegg, we realized a $2.2 million gain. Chegg is an important story just because what we've said publicly for some time, it's our intent that 12 months after a company goes public, lock, well, after, 12 months after the lockup period, after a company goes public, it's our intent that we'll monetize or liquidate our position. And with Chegg, we kept it uh, well beyond that 12-month that period of the lockup. And the reason for that, it had a broken IPO. Uh, it, at its low point, sold at $3.47 a couple of years ago. And given both our uh, deep understanding of the company as well as why the stock was where it was, we thought there was a dr dramatic uh, mismatch between what Chegg share shares were worth and what it was selling for. And so we kept our shares um, throughout that, and ultimately this spring, sold our entire position ultimately at 1950 was the last shares that we sold. In terms of losses, and the reason I um, painfully stand in front of you with, with this sheet is, it, again, it goes back, a number of these pieces have been uh, over the last you know, the, several years. I think the lessons we learned were many years ago in terms of what you could expect going forward. And so the common denominator are two things. One is, uh, we're not going to be taking technology risk in the GSV capital portfolio. We just don't need that volatility. And so it's really emerging growth stage businesses um, where the technology risk is, is, is mainly behind us. And the other piece is just that there are emerging growth companies. And you'll see what the portfolio looks like today and what you can expect going forward. In terms of 2017 notable financings, uh, Coursera, uh, the leading uh, platform for online education, uh, raised $64 million. It's one of our top five positions. Lyft, uh, the, the rideshare company that's getting increased momentum in the marketplace, raised $1.7 billion in a Series H uh, led by Google and KKR. Also in 2017, at the end of last year, we did a, a strategic uh, partnership, which included an investment in GSV by HMC Capital, which is a $10 billion investment firm based in Latin America, which uh, provides a couple key things for us. One, access to some of the most prominent families and, fu families and funds in, a, in an area that we think is quite attractive, as, as well as um, you know, partnerships that, that we've been able to create that we think are going to add a lot of value for GSV and GSV Capital. So portfolio state of play, back to fundamentals and things we've learned and things that we've executed against and things that you can expect as, you look, as we look forward. You know, first of all, today in the portfolio, there's 29 investments. What we said three years ago is we're going to reduce the, you know, not only are we going to invest in larger, 100% larger um, uh, emerging growth stage businesses, but we're going to take our portfolio positions down significantly. And the primary reason for that is getting this discount from NAV to share price where people can look at the portfolio and not look at, you know, 55 names, but can look at fewer names to really say, okay, I can understand this, I understand that. And, and, and less than that, that discount. So we've gone from 52 companies in the portfolio three years ago to 29 currently. If you look at the five top positions of GSV Capital, it's 59% of the portfolio. So in other words, you can look at just five names, look at, do some math, and you can say, well, how does that compare to what the NAV is? And we think that's important to see that, that appreciation for any NAV to stock price. And two of the names with us are actually public today. So you, you, know, it's, you don't have to do a whole lot of work to, to get what the value is. So the top five positions, again, 59% of the overall portfolio. That contrasts to a year ago where the top five positions were 36%. And if you look at the top 10, posi 10 positions, 83% of the portfolio today is in the top 10 positions. So as, again, it's doing exactly what we said we were going to do. And we think that will have po continued positive implications for a share price. 
A key a hallmark of what we do and focus on and we've been able to do is we invest alongside and behind the best venture capitalists in the world, the ones that are investing in very early stage and we've shown our ability to, to partner in those names, companies like Andreessen Horowitz and Benchmark and Kleiner Perkins, again, are, are um, investors that we've been able to, to invest alongside. So 94% of the portfolio today is in B round and beyond. Again, back to this focus on emerging growth stage, later stage. As I think you look ahead, what you'll see is that it's not only B round and beyond, it's really probably going to be closer to C round and beyond. Another thing that we focused on, and then back to things that we just uh, recognized in terms of where our advantages were, um, that we said you're going to see a shift from primary shares to secondary shares, most likely. When we're agnostic, we want to invest in the best emerging growth companies, private companies in the world. But we felt like we had advantages investing in secondaries that others didn't have. And while primaries are interest attractive because you get the data room and the company's model, we just felt like we could do a better job by, by we're going to get more opportunities in the secondary. And you've seen, even from a year ago, you've seen a shift um, to secondary now being the predominant. And I think, again, we'll be you know, looking on a case-by-case -case basis. But if I were to guess, a year from now, staying up here, you'll see even a greater shift. Portfolio distribution today, um, the, the major themes, education technology, 33%. Cloud big data, 30%. Marketplaces, 18%. Um, uh, social, social mobile, 18%. Sustainability being 1%. And in the program today, you're going to have, we have different panels on themes that, that we're focused on. So you're going to hear from companies and from people at GSV as, as we're looking at uh, important themes that are going to complement the portfolio strategies that we've implemented to date. In terms of 2018 portfolio activity, uh, one of the, some of the highlights, Dropbox going public a few months back uh, with a 40% pop the first day. Dropbox is a remarkable business. Uh, we're very, very bullish on its prospects looking forward. 500 million users. Uh, today or yesterday, the stock was selling just under $30. I think today it closed just over $30. We carried on our books at $27 after the first quarter. Uh, it's a 91% return to date. Spotify shares uh, obviously listed themselves in an unusual move a few months back as well. Spotify, um, largest music business in the world with 170 million users, 75 million subscribers, a really powerful business model with high reoccurring revenue and low churn. Like Dropbox, you know, subscription-based, low churn, great visibility, great growth. We love consumer businesses that are addictive that don't cause cancer. Both Spotify and Dropbox are those kind of businesses. So today, Spotify is $154. We carried it at the end of the first quarter, $132. So to date, it's a 264% return. General Assembly, um, the leader in providing courses to people to give them modern work skills and technology. Sold in April to, to ADECO for $413 million. We had carried at the end of the first quarter at $9.6 million, about a 60% return for our shareholders. GSV Labs, and you're going to hear from our new CEO, Nikhil Sinha, in a few minutes, um, did a $7 million financing, um, which we're very excited about. We think the potential for GS Labs is enormous. Uh, we're seeing great momentum. You're obviously here. I'd encourage you to take a tour later. Um, but now uh, with, the, with the CEO and capital, we think that we are uh, positioned to really um, do some, some important things as this global innovation uh, ecosystem is, is being developed around the world. And GSV Capital owns more than 50% of GSV Labs. Nikhil Sinha is in the back of the room, and I'll introduce in a few minutes came to us over the last month. He has a perfect background to lead this organization. Nikhil, just before coming here, was the chief business officer at Coursera. You'll hear from the, from the Coursera CEO afterwards. Um, he also, in his background, started a university, a successful university in India. He was a three-time successful entrepreneur, uh, selling his startups to um, uh, enterprises. He also uh, was a dean at the University of Texas School. And so really interesting background for what we're doing at GSV Labs, and you'll hear 
um, that story in a few minutes. Some of the tailwinds at the back of GSV Capital in our opportunities we look ahead. First of all, in terms of the IPO landscape, we are in a very good IPO market, 76 U.S. IPOs in 2018 year to date. That's up 33% year over year. $33.1 billion in total IPO proceeds. That's up 126% year over year. You look at pricing of IPOs, and I always look at pricing of IPOs to give the true investment sentiment, what's going on. Is it too hot? Is it just right or is it too cold? So in a normal IPO market, what you'd expect is about 60% of IPOs to price within the range, 20% above, 20% below. Year to date, 63% of the IPOs are within the range, just 17% um, percent above and 20% below. And so what that says to me is that we're in a normal IPO market, which, which given the momentum, I think that, that gives me confidence that you're going to see this go for some time. Another indicator is what's the IPO pop or how does the stock trade on the first day after going public? In a normal environment, you'd expect about a 10 to 15% pop. Year to date, you've seen a 13% pop. Again, right in that normal zone, which I think is, again, healthy and encouraging. 28 VC-backed IPOs year to date. And what the VCs are seeing is you've got a healthy environment, not too hot, not too cold. So they're, they're going into the water, and they're seeing the water is fine. I think you'll continue to see that trend. And as I mentioned, $33 billion of IPO proceeds to date. Put that in contrast, that's more, that's already, and we're not even halfway through the year, more than we've seen the three previous years. So again, uh, we think we're in a really interesting environment. In terms of the unicorn phenomena, obviously unicorns have become quite the thing where historically this idea of a VC-backed private company with a billion dollar greater market value was extraordinary. In fact, in 2000, there was just one unicorn. Today, there's 238 unicorns, if I can get the slide up. So 238 unicorns, um, and people say, well, is that because we're in a bubble? Or people in Silicon Valley are more likely to say, well, that's because we're in a boom. But what's the truth? Some, what we see is a combination of fundamentals and supply and demand that put this kind of backdrop where you're seeing companies that you've never seen before, and those are the companies that we want to be participating in. So looking at the supply-demand scenario, from 1990 to 2000, on average, there's 406 IPOs per year. During the past 17 years, you've had just 110 per year on average, so about an 80% reduction in the number of IPOs. From time from VC investment to monetization has gone from 3.1 years to over 10 years today. So tripled you know, during that time period. And the, the size of companies going public has gone from 130 million on average to 1.1 billion. So you've seen far fewer IPOs. You've seen companies, the, the, the time frame from monetization has tripled. And the size of companies going public is up nearly 10x. Also fundamentals in supply and demand, corporate cash is $2.2 trillion. For context, the entire Indian GDP is $2.2 trillion. Technology, like a lot of other industries, is going through massive consolidation with the big companies buying up promising disruptive companies to fill up their product map. So in the last six years, you've had over 500 M&A transactions in the technology world, $160 billion of transaction value. And so some of the companies in our portfolio are being bought, as, we, as we've talked about Jam, and talked about General Assembly. And I'll add that all up, you'd have about a 50% reduction, oops, 50% reduction in the number of public traded IPOs. So supply demand characteristics are pretty extreme. In the first quarter alone, venture capitalists invested in $28.2 billion into, into new businesses, 1,700 deals. Globally, and this has become a global phenomenon, $49 billion has been invested. On average, the past 16 years, there's 3,500 companies per year that have been invested in by venture capitalists. Think about that, 3,500 companies per year, just 64 venture-backed companies that went public last year. There's over 2,000 VC-backed private companies with $100 million or greater market value. So think about that. There's only 3,500 publicly traded stocks and there's 2,000 private companies in the U.S. with $100 million or greater market value. So the funnel for opportunity is, over the last 10 years alone, you have about 35,000 companies that venture capitalists have, been, have invested in. About 16,000 of those, more or less, are still alive today in some form or fashion. Of those, 2,000 have $100 million or greater market value. 
of those 2,000, there's about a 250 that we think are interesting enough, fit our themes, fit our focus to pay attention to. And of those, about 25 are on our priority list. And those 25 are the ones that we are looking to access and have part of our portfolio, and as you see, have significant positions in. And so we see the land of opportunity for GSV Capital really being the area where companies used to go public and where they go public today, and it's a very field for hunting, what we call the land of opportunity. So venture capital and you know, searching for the land of opportunity, that's not a new phenomenon. In fact, you know, Christopher Columbus, the great entrepreneur and explorer, had this concept you know, 500 years ago. He was finding a shorter route to go from Europe to Asia. Right? So he took this idea to King John of Portugal, and he said, you know, here's what I think. King John said, this is intriguing. He brought it to his advisors. His advisors said, too risky. And so they turned it down. So like a good entrepreneur, he saw Queen Isabel in Spain in 1486. She took it to her investment committee. The investment committee took it down, turned it down, too risky. So what's a great entrepreneur do? Goes back to King John again for a second attempt pitches his new idea, and luck would have it. Already, Bartholomew uh, Diaz had gone around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa to find this quicker route. So he lost his first mover advantage. King John of Portugal turned him down. So what's he do now? He goes to the family offices in Genoa in 1488 and Venice in 1488. But the dumb money wanted to know why the smart money had rejected him. So that, well, that went away. So what did he do? He did what any desperate person does. He hired an investment banker. And so this investment banker happened to be his brother, Bartholomew Columbus, who in 1488 uh, was, was went around trying to find money for this funding this concept. He went up to King Henry VII in England. He went to King Charles VIII in France. And, but these guys wanted to say, OK, if this is such a great idea, why do you have to call him all the way up here to get the money? So they rejected him. But King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel saw something in this Columbus that they liked. And so they brought him in-house. And so he became like one of the first entrepreneurs in residence. Three years with King you know, kind of hatching this plan. They finally couldn't get it all together. They turned him away as legend had it, uh, sent him out of town on a donkey, but then retrieved him, brought him back, cut a deal. And basically his deal, sorry, was to get 10% of revenue from all new lands recovering to per per perpetuity, basically carried interest. And so his plan looked like this, going from Europe, sailing west, hit Asia. But in one of the great pivots of all time, he discovered America. <laughs> so as the great philosopher Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so the other thing that's in the way that we are looking at the world that we're in is times are changing, and they're changing faster than ever. And it's, so as you're trying to think about the future, what's going to happen in the future, um, it's really hard. So you've got to think, what are the fundamentals you focus on? And so, sorry, these fundamentals, it's, it's like predicting the weather. That's hard. You know, it's really tough to predict the weather. But you, you do know that the sun rises in the east, and you do know that fall follows spring. Or as the great late George Carlin said, weather forecast for tonight, dark. So we're focused on fundamentals like demographics and other changes that you can see from a long way to focus. That's where we're focusing our influence and our, and our resources. So in the old world, to predict the future, you know, we were in linear times. And so while it's always tough to predict the future, you could basically extrapolate the past into the future, and that became your forecast. And going back to our friends, you know, Columbus, when he had the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, you know, his boat looked like this. And his GPS system was looking at the stars. Well, 100, 500 years before that, oops, 500 years before that, basically had ships that looked the same and used the same type of GPS. You fast forward 500 years into the future, and Columbus wouldn't be even be able to understand what he was looking at. We're sending ships to Mars, and not only that, but we're putting a Tesla with it. His literally, his brain would be blown away. So we're in exponential times with things changing faster and faster. And so looking for a, a great example of uh, uh, seeing in the exponential times, meet the Jetsons. Right.
So the Jetsons were created 55 years ago, 56 years ago, in 1962, imagining what 100 years in the future was going to look like, the future of 2062. Remarkable is they predicted drones. They predicted the Hyperloop. They have predicted smartwatches. They predicted FaceTime. They predicted 3D printed food. They even predicted robot assistants. What they didn't predict, interestingly, was, a, was what a modern school would really look like. In fact, Boy Elroy could have basically been put back in the Flintstones that wouldn't have made any difference. It was the same thing. So when you look at one of our major themes of, of education technology, we're trying to reagine what a future looks like um, more consistent with what we see in other areas of society. So the future of the future is exponential, and things are changing fast. So looking at the time to reach 50 million people after disruptive technology has launched, you've seen that time compress dramatically. So when airlines, airplanes were introduced commercially, it took 68 years before 50 million people had actually flown them. The telephone, it took 50 years. Electricity, 46 years. Computers, 14 years. Cell phones, 12 years. The internet, the internet seven years. Facebook, three years. Twitter, it took two years to reach 50 million people. And Pokemon Go reached 50 million people in 19 days. So times are changing extremely fast. And what's, hap what's contributed to this is what I call the Big Bang of four key fundamentals. Moore's Law, the Fall of the Wall, Internet, and Human Genome Project. So Moore's Law, created by you know, George, um, Gordon Moore over 50 years ago, with computing power doubling every couple of years, has resulted in the iPhone 10 that was introduced last fall being more powerful than the computer that landed astronauts on the moon. By 2025, if Moore's Law continues, the computing power will be processed faster than the human brain. And you can put a lens on a blind person to sensors and have them be able to see. In fact, smartphones in 2025 will be as powerful as the IBM Watson today. The second big bang is the fall of the wall. So when Ronald Reagan said in 19, 1988, you know, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev, in 1989, it happened. What this did was unleash this incredible wave of globalization, capitalism, and democracy. So today, 56% of the world lives in a democracy. You look at business, in 1990, after the fall of the wall happened, just 15% of the S&P 500's revenues came from outside the United States. Today, it's nearly 50%. Global middle class has gone from 1 billion people to 3.2 billion people, expected to reach 5.2 billion people by 2050. Airline travel, you had 1 billion people flying airlines in 1990. Today, it's 4 billion. It's going to double again by 2036 to 8 billion. Dubai International Airport is the busiest airport in the world today. 90 million people go through Dubai International Airport. In 1990, that was 5 million people. It's incredible. The world cities are getting to be more important as a place of commerce and connectivity, basically local network effects. In 1900, just 13% of the population lived in cities. Today, it's 56%. It's going to 70%. The world's great cities are getting bigger and greater. Manila, 40 million people. By 2100, that's approximately the same size as California. Mumbai, 83 million people. Lagos, 88 million people. Also, sorry, economic uh, uh, combinations, or collaborations are being created. So China's One Belt, One Road is an incredibly uh, big initiative, which basically has two-thirds of the world's population connected. It led from China, connected through Asia, Africa, Middle East, and parts of Europe. About 32% of global GDP affected by One Belt, One Road. We've got a concept called One America, looking basically connecting Canada to Chile, which is a billion people and 31% of global GDP, but you're seeing a tremendous amount of opportunity. And lastly, what our firm is named after, this is a phenomena of the global Silicon Valley. We like to say with a mindset that's made this place such an amazing place of entrepreneurship and innovation is going global, and it's going viral from Austin to Boston, from Chicago to Sao Paulo, from Mumbai to Shanghai to Dubai. That's the global Silicon Valley, and we think that's the opportunity for us. The third big bang is the internet. So in 1994, Mark Andreessen with Netscape introduced the world to com the commercialized net. 
The digital tracks that have been laid over the last uh, 24 years resulted with 3.8 million people on the internet, and the disruption that's caused to business is extraordinary. So if you look at the five largest market cap companies in the world 50 years ago, IBM, AT&T, General Motors, Standard Oil, and Kodak, two of those five in the next 50-year period actually went bankrupt. If you look at the five largest market cap companies in the world today, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, Facebook, three of those are located within 10 miles of here, and all are part of this dynamic internet technology world. If you look at the sixth and seventh, eighth largest market cap companies in the world, Alibaba and Tencent, what's remarkable that, about that is not only the fact that they're based in China, but Alibaba, Tencent, Facebook didn't even exist 20 years ago, and they're the largest market cap companies in the world. There's 4.8 billion people that have a cell phone around the world. If we put that in context, there's just 4.2 billion people that have a toothbrush. Everything is smart, from phones to watches, smart cities, even smart water. Looking at telecommunications from the internet, a long distance phone call that cost $15 in 1990, it's free today through WhatsApp and Skype. Whoops, shoot, guys. So look at this picture. This is St. Peter's Square in 2005. See what's changed? So in a world where we've had this explosion of digital photography, Kodak, which was synonymous with photography, went bankrupt in 2011, and by the way, had the patent for digital photography. The same year that Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion dollars, and Snapchat was founded, and Snapchat today, by the way, has a $14 billion market cap. So Larry Page has said, you know, lots of people don't succeed over time. Lots of companies don't succeed over time. What do they fundamentally do wrong? They miss the future. The fourth big bang is the Human Genome Project, which mapped out the human genome from 2000 to 2003. During a 20-year period, about a trillion dollars of economic impact was created. 5,000 genetic diseases can be diagnosed today, 132 personalized medicines. And again, um, in uh, 23andMe, $199 for a personal genomic map. And you're going to hear a panel about digital health um, later today, which I think you'll find quite interesting. The world's population in 1900 was 1.6 billion people. Today it's 7.4 billion, 9.7 billion by 2050. The average male lived to be 31 years old in 1900. Today they lived to be 72 years old, 85 years old by 2050. Two out of three babies born today are going to live to be 100 years old or greater. They used to grow up with physical Legos. Today, they're growing up with digital technology. So reimagining what this future looks like, the people living to be 100, growing up with technology, um, that's um, very exciting for us. And you leak about it, the world's largest media company, Facebook, doesn't have any of its own content. The world's largest lodging company, Airbnb doesn't have any of its own hotel rooms. The largest music company in the world, Spotify, doesn't produce any of its own music. The largest storage company in the world doesn't have its own, any of its own warehouses. And the largest transportation company, Didi, doesn't have any of their own cars. So as we think about um, the rest of this afternoon and the themes that we're focused on, we're trying to reimagine what the future is and how do we identify and access those companies and put them in GSV capital portfolio. So the themes that we're focused on, cloud and big data, which includes AI and robotics, you know, internet of things and digital doctors, sustainability and impact. You know, from John Dennison at the end of the day, when you think about impact, it's really more than just doing good. In fact, we think the business of the future are about not only wellness and water, but it's how you, the corporate mission aligns, not only just the economic value, but societal values. Social mobile, companies like Nextdoor and Slack changing the market. Marketplaces, which we always love, companies like Lyft, Airbnb. The education theme, the global marketplace, knowledge-based economy, what you know, your education makes a difference not only for an individual, but for a company, and for that matter, a country. We, we see these weapons of mass instruction being created, like Coursera with 31 million students, Clever with 60,000 uh, schools, Course here with 10 million users. Um, company presentations today, which we're quite excited about, Coursera, Ron Johnson with Enjoy, who I interviewed, GSV Labs, and Coursero. 
in some of the themes of panels, AI and data science, peer-to-peer -peer digital health and impact, and then corporate disruption. So we think we've got a very rich agenda full of you know, perspective from where the world's going, what the future might look like. And after all that, we'll have a reception here starting at 5. We'll all be around to talk and, and discuss any um, thoughts you have and questions you may have. So with that, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. It's my distinct pleasure now to introduce um, the CEO of GSV Labs, Nikhil Sinha.